What's cracking, big dogs? How we doing, YouTube? Welcome back to the HQ. It's big dogs got to eat, BDG eat. Fantasy football, it's your man's Nicholas here. We're going to continue along the, the saga of do not draft players in 2019 fantasy football. Last week, we covered running backs not to draft in 2019 fantasy football. On Monday, we did the wide receiver edition of that, and I realized that those videos are popping off right now, so I have an influx of new subscribers. So welcome back if you're new. Welcome if you are new new today's gonna be another really good episode we're gonna talk about my top busts or players to avoid in 2019 fantasy football at the quarterback and or tight end position what i usually like to do is you know think of some kind of topic like this and it's almost like a an episodical thing you all didn't think i had that vocab in me did you whether it's sleepers or players to avoid or rankings or whatever i like to go episode by episode maybe do one for running backs one for wide receivers and then one for quarterbacks tight ends so that's probably going to be the gist of how this summer goes for the Monday, Wednesday videos. It's June already, so you know we're going five videos a week. Today, we are talking about quarterbacks, tight ends, not to draft, to avoid, top busts at those positions. A lot of OGs on the list, thus I'm paying homage to the YouTube OG. If you don't know where this is from, that's fine. I'm not gonna say you're too young for the channel because I realize that a lot of my demographic is young people, but go Google this, go educate yourself. After you do that, come back and I'll, edu I'll educate you on some, uh, some fantasy football stuff. So let's get into it. <laughs> We're gonna run on the quarterbacks first. If you're watching my videos, you know that I go in depth on my players. If you're coming on here and you're expecting me to talk for 30 seconds or two minutes about a player, you're not on the right channel. Or I will have the timestamps down below. You can skip to the player that you want to watch. If you're gonna be mad that I'm about to talk about Big Fat Ben for seven minutes. This ain't the right HQ for you. Go find a different headquarters to watch videos at. Big Ben, Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback. I often say on my channel that a fantasy quarterback is going to be as good as the weapons and the offense around him, right? Unless you're elite, like the Aaron Rodgers or the Andrew Luck, who could elevate their entire team and elevate themselves as a fantasy asset, or you're really bad, you're a really bad thrower, you're probably in that mid-range and you're probably going to be as good as the team around you. And Big Ben, of course, you could say he's above average, he probably is. But in terms of the weapons that he's had around him for his entire career, they have been far above average. A very good offensive line. He's had Antonio Brown, Juju Smith-Schuster now, you know, a plethora of other wide receivers that have come in and out, Le'Veon Bell for the most part. He's had a great offense to work with. Coming into 2019, though, the offense is going to be shaped a little differently. I think they're getting to the point where people are like hating on them so much that they might end up being a value, and that might be the case for Big Ben. But with Antonio Brown gone, I do think that this offense might go a little more run heavy, which I think usually tends to have fewer points scored for that offense. I think they're going to be on a little bit of a decline with Antonio Brown gone, right? He's one of the best outside weapons in the entire NFL. There's no debating that. I don't have to, we don't have to yell about that. Ben finished last year as a quarterback three in fantasy. He had the ridiculously high volume of passing yards, right? He led the league with passing yards, 5,129 passing yards from Big Ben. Fifth highest passing touchdown total last year with 34. But he also led the league in interceptions with 16. He threw 31 interceptable passes per playerprofiler.com, which was second most among the quarterbacks. His PFF grade at the quarterback position was 17th and his adjusted completion percentage 29th out of 39 qualified quarterbacks. His red zone completion percentage was 28th. He led both red zone interceptions and 10 zone interceptions among NFL quarterbacks last year. His deep ball completion percentage was 26th. AKA, he was not efficient whatsoever. The volume was very high for this passing offense. The weapons around him were obviously very good, which plumped up his fantasy stats. Quarterback three finish, great if you had him last year, but it's not something I look at as predictive going forward. I don't think you're going to get anywhere near a top five finish out of Ben in 2019. Here's the big facts here, though. Big stat, and this was from a Mike Taglieri podcast. He works for Fantasy Pros. Ben totaled a league low 46% of his passing yards through the air in 2019, which means, do the mathematics, 100 minus 46, 54% of his passing yards came after the catch. 54% of his total passing yards came after Juju or Antonio Brown or Vance McDonald caught the ball and then accumulated those yards. He had a league low 46% of his passing yards come through the air. Unsurprising with the weapon groups that he has around him. Sure, the Steelers added wideouts this offseason. They, they kind of shocked me. I think it was a pretty much a, a surprise pick for a lot of people when they took Deontay Johnson. Third round, second pick of the third round this year. I'm not exactly sure what they see in Deontay, Deontay Johnson. A lot of people like him from his college tape, which is clear, like, 
anytime we talk about any rookie, there are going to be like six people that are like, he was so good in college, whatever. He's an undersized receiver, 18th percentile for weight adjusted speed score. Similar metrics to Antonio Brown, admittedly, except his breakout age is below average while he was playing at Toledo in the MAC. So less competition and still took him a long time to break out, almost 21 years old, while Brown did it at the age of 19 in the 87th percentile. That's such a big predictive number for you guys that are new to fantasy football. When you're looking at rookie prospects and probable breakouts, the guys who are able to break out at a young age, and this is just like a side tip. I think everyone can, can take away from this. There's a lot of common sense behind this. Receivers who break out in college, right, have their, their big breakout years at a young age are much more likely to become successful NFL wide receivers. And if you match that with high draft capital, then you're looking at not a bust proof, but a very, very, very high likelihood of falling out. There's a reason why a lot of those guys like the Devontae Parkers, the Josh Doxons, and possibly Hakeem Butler this year, look so goddamn good on tape and you go back and you're like, yeah, their senior year was so good. And then they flop in the NFL. It's because they were not able to break out at a younger age. And it tells you like, think about just the science or the biology behind it, right? When you're 18 or 19, if you're able to break out at that age, there's so much like growth and strength that goes into the, in, into a, a guy's body when you're growing up between the age, when you're 19, the difference between you and when you're 21 or 22 is a massive difference. So if you're able to produce at the age of 18 or 19, like that's your breakout age, that means you're probably producing off of just raw talent and how good you are. The guys that produce at 21 years old, that's their breakout age. They've had the years to develop the routes, the chemistry, the strength and size in their body. It's just, it's almost common sense at, at that point. So the clearest indicator for how good a real, like a player is going to be, and you look at like a Juju Smith-Schuster who broke out at a very, very young age. The majority of guys in the NFL that have had success have done so early on in their college career. So that's the point here I'm kind of getting with uh, Deontay Johnson. Almost 21 years old when he broke out, 42nd percentile. So it's not horrible, but below average. So they add Deontay Johnson, they also signed Dante Moncrief, who will battle with James Washington, who was trash last year. Obviously, people were in their feelings and getting mad on the internet about me talking about James Washington as someone I'm absolutely staying away from in the do not draft wide receiver video. I actually low-key love the Moncrief signing. I've kind of been sniping him and drafting him in like a lot of my best ball leagues in like the 14th, 15th, 16th round. But regardless, outside of Juju, they have a bunch of unproven weapons. No matter how good you think someone might be, there's no one that's going to step up and fill the void of what Antonio Brown is leaving there. You can create all the hypo hypothetical success and, and upside that you want to, but you at least have to acknowledge that the range of outcomes for this wide receiver group is that they're bad outside of Juju Smith-Schuster. And then there's the argument, oh, but the Steelers are really good at drafting wide receivers. And if, you know, if I could... This was Instagram. I throw a picture up of the fucking SpongeBob meme with the, all the uppercase and lowercase letters going by. I'm not denying that. Juju, Antonio Brown, Martavis Bryant, who by all measures uh, wasn't really a breakout or a great draft prospect in my opinion. He never had 800 yards in a season. Ended up being a headache for them. But talent was there, whatever. Emmanuel Sanders, Antonio Holmes, very, very good at drafting wide receivers. But in that same time span, guys, for every one of the Jujus, there's three Freddie Gibsons, Willie Reeves, Dallas Bakers, Lima Swedes, Tony Clemens, Justin Brown, Marcus Wheaton, Sammy Coates, and Marcus Ayers. The list goes on and on and on. Realistically, compared to other teams, relative to other teams drafting wide receivers, the Steelers have probably been the best in the NFL, but they are still far, far, far below a 50% hit rate. It's very hard to draft NFL prospects and have them turn out to be successful. So if they're below 50%, you have to acknowledge that. These are these are big facts, guys. Like I try to be unbiased here and tell you the entire story from my eyes, my point of view, but I also like to hear like what you guys think. Are you drafting Big Ben if his value falls far enough? Drop a comment down below and let me know how you feel about Big Ben. I think people who owned him versus people who didn't own him last year probably have different viewpoints on it. And I like to hear all your guys' takes on this stuff. So make sure you drop a comment. Make sure you hit that thumbs up if you're enjoying the video. While you're down there, subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're breaking down big facts like this all the time. So, you know, I just look at this offense and I think it's an offense trending in the wrong direction relative to where they've been the last, you know, five, six years. I think they're going to be a little bit more of a run-heavy approach. I do give credit to Pittsburgh because they've caught, kept this offensive line very strong for a very long time. But Big Ben is probably a guy I'm staying away from if any of the hype from last year is still sitting on him, marinating into his ADP. That is quarterback one. Next quarterback I am avoiding is Tom Brady of the New England Patriots. Now, if you're like privy or if you're savvy to fantasy football, you know that Brady is probably like quarterback 18 or 20 this year in fantasy. If you haven't looked at anything, you would probably just assume he's a top 10, top 8 fantasy quarterback, right? You're like, why the fuck would he be a do not draft guy? Brady's name still holds a lot of value in fantasy football, but he did not perform well at all last year in fantasy. And I know I got to bring the big facts here because if you come at the king, you best not miss. 
or so I've been told, something something along those lines. Brady finished last year with 4,355 passing yards, 29 touchdowns, 11 interceptions. Statistically speaking, very solid all-around performance for a typical quarterback, but I don't think that's the case for like the 31 time Super Bowl champion, right? You, you expect elite numbers out of Brady, and that's where he was drafted. If you're in like a super flex league last year, he was a you know top three round pick or so. Obviously, he's getting very old. He has put up arguably the best attack against Father Time that we as humans have have ever seen up to this point. When you look at the numbers for the fourth consecutive year, Brady's attempts per game, passing yards per game, and fantasy points per game have decreased linearly. Four years straight, we're seeing all three of those categories go down. Brady turns 42 this August. You want to argue that he's seen symptoms of uh, father time affecting him? I don't know. I mean, he's still looking like a good quarterback, but he's not prime time Brady anymore. So the 42 years old obviously has to be factored in. The fall off is eventually coming. I'm not someone who sits here every year and tells you not to draft Brady. I was actually on the opposite end of it last year. I was very high on Brady. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. But when you look at the Patriots team, right, for the first time since 2010, the Patriots threw the ball on fewer than 55% of their offensive plays. First time since 2010. It seems obvious that they're trying to go with a more run heavy approach. When you look at like the draft picks that they've been making, they took Sonny Michelle in the first round last year. When he was on the field, he was getting 20, 25 carries a game. They take Damian Harris, the running back out of Alabama with their third round pick. This is uh, splits of Tom Brady's games last year in which Rex Burkhead and Sonny Michelle were both playing on the field, right? I don't know where else they would fucking be playing jungle gym. So yeah, on, on the field. You see the pass attempts number dropped by more than five pass attempts per game. Yardage went down by 55 yards. When they drafted Damian Harris in the third round this year, I think that that basically just ensured that at any time throughout the year, they will have one competent, good, solid running back that they could feed you know, 15, 18, 20 carries to at, on any given game. So I look at this offense and where it's going, and I think it's just slowly maneuvering away from Brady, of course. And don't forget, they drafted Isaiah Wynn last year, right? Sonny Michelle was their first round pick, but he was their second first round pick of last year. They had two. The first one they used, I think it was the 23rd overall pick, was actually Sonny Michelle's teammate at Georgia, the guard, Isaiah Wynn. Very, 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 very good offensive lineman who could play guard tackle. They just needed him to kind of fit into the role. He was picked before Sonny Michelle. And I think that was also like another approach to kind of obviously shore up the offensive line, but go more run heavy. They lose Gronk to retirement. Chris Hogan is gone. Fooling yourself if you think Josh Gordon is making any type of return. He's going to actually make an impact in 2019. They did draft and kill Harry, who I absolutely love with their first round pick. But I mean, he's a rookie. The wide receiver depth chart is one of the most depleted in the NFL. So it was the easiest thing to see coming that they were going to use one of those early round picks on a wide receiver. I'm glad they I'm glad they grabbed and kill Harry. We don't know how long Brady's going to play for. So we don't know, you know, when to kill Harry hits his prime, who's quarterback's actually going to be. But it's wheels up for the ground game in New England, if, if you ask me. Their game plan is to keep Brady upright on the field without taking too many hits. And that's what will give them success again in, in 2019. Brady should be efficient, but he's not a top 10 fantasy quarterback. And if you look at the second half of the year, if you look at the majority of his games, he was not a top 12 quarterback last year. So he was not giving you the normal upside or floor that you expect from Brady. And there's no reason to think that it's going to be any different a year older for him. So we got Big Ben, we got Brady, and just quickly would like to plug, if you want all of my busts, all my top guys to avoid, they will be available in the Big Dogs Draft Guide, which is on bigdogsdraftguide.com, which you can pre-order for 20% off right Now, it drops on July 1st, so it's not out yet, but pre-order for a little bit of a discount. It's got all my players to avoid. It's got my top sleepers, my must-draft players, my top 250 big board, my rankings, uh, positional rankings broken down by tier, PPR, half PPR, standard. You can access it on your laptop, your computer, your tablet, your phone, anything you need for the draft. You can print it out if you want to bring in the rankings for the draft and cross them off as you go along. It's got a ton of exclusive articles and exclusive content that you won't find on YouTube or in the blog or on the podcast. It's the one-stop shop you need for your fantasy football season. I promise you that. You will not have to look elsewhere. It's the only prep you need for your draft. We take all the best content that we put out throughout the summer, which is a lot, considering we're going five videos a week, and we package it up like I'm fucking Salt Bay, and I sprinkle it into a draft guide for you. So check that out, bigdogsdraftguide.com. Let's talk about some honorable mentions in the quarterback vicinity. First up, I think we just need to acknowledge the whole Patrick Mahomes thing, and his ADP Again, for people that are new to fantasy football, ADP means average draft position. So on average, where these guys are getting picked, Mahomes' ADP is quarterback one, and he is still my quarterback one in fantasy. But where he was going in the beginning of the summer and where he might go in a lot of friends and family leagues is, you know, maybe the first round, which is just asinine. But he was going second and third round for the most part. That's just way too early. 
even in the beginning of the summer, before we heard anything about Tyreek Hill, he was a fourth round pick at the earliest for me. He's still a QB1, but I think with the news of Tyreek Hill, he moves back into a tier with the other guys. Like, I think you can make a legitimate argument that you would rather have Andrew Luck or even Deshaun. I've heard a lot of people that like Deshaun Watson as their quarterback one. How much do you like Aaron Rodgers to bounce back? I think I think what happened is with Tyreek Hill out, he moves from being in his own tier, sort of like Saquon Barkley, right? Moving from his own tier to a tier with the with these other top guys. You look at his numbers, 5,100 passing yards last year, over 50 passing touchdowns. Obviously, there's going to be regression. Everyone comes out like, oh, Patrick Mahomes is going to have regression. Like, fuck, okay, thank you. That's not a hot take, Skip Bayless. The problem with the regression is he might still end up as quarterback one. So he's going to be fine for your fantasy team, but... The value that he gave you last year is that he was just so much better than all the other fantasy quarterbacks, which I don't think is going to be the case this year. He could still drop off 10 touchdowns and 1,000 passing yards, go for you know 4,500 passing yards, 300 ground yards, and 38 passing touchdowns, easily be the quarterback one, but the value he holds, the, you know, the points per game difference he gives you over whoever the quarterback two is, is not going to be that wide as it was last year. The numbers, the regression just says that. You look at Tariq Hill, he was seeing 23.6% of their targets which was the 16th highest in the NFL last year, but his air yards were sixth highest in the NFL. He accounted for 37% of Kansas City's air yards. He is a guy that absolutely just changes your offense, right? And it's going to be difficult to replace him, you know, with McCole Hardman, but just difficult to find something like that opens up the offense and gives you the holes for the running backs and gives you running lanes for the quarterback and gives you the middle of the field wide open for Travis Kelsey and things like that. So uh, without Hill, I think that's such an underrated, like, aspect of, of Patrick Mahomes' game. So if he's still going in the second, third, fourth round, I think he needs to be off your list. I think fifth round now is probably appropriate given where the other quarterbacks are going. You can get Luck, Watson, Rodgers in the sixth, seventh round, and I don't think he's that far ahead of those guys anymore. The other quarterback on this list for me is uh, Cam Newton. Not a guy I'm fading. I want to preface with that. But if you are concerned, it, the, the shoulder is a concern for me, okay? Uh, I'm not fading him outright because the shoulder was clearly less than 100%. It's been a less than 100% for a while now. But the problem was that can't, uh, Carolina was so fucking bad at handling the situation. He had the shoulder surgery and he was barely throwing the football up until like when the season started. He was clearly less than 100%. And they're just like, fuck it. We're going to throw him out there and let him do his thing when he was less than 100%. Obviously, that's going to come back and bite him in the ass. This time he has a shoulder surgery. So he has, he has two shoulder surgeries. I'm having a lot of trouble saying shoulder today. Two sole shoulder surgeries in, you know, a couple of years span. So that's very concerning. This time around, though, he had it very early in the offseason, and he's actually throwing full-size footballs again. So that's good. So he's got two months to ramp up that shoulder strength and throw the full-size footballs, not like last time he came out when he wasn't doing that until, like, late August. A lot, le a lot less risky this time around, if you ask me. So, again, I, I will say... I'm not fading Cam Newton, but if you are that concerned about his injury, the shoulder, I think it's a legitimate concern. So I wouldn't be mad at you for fading. This is me giving you permission to not draft Cam Newton if you're concerned about the injury, because I, I am a little bit admittedly. Those are the quarterbacks. Drop down below what quarterbacks you are fading. Let me know what you think about the list so far. We have Big Ben, Tom Brady, Cam Newton, Patrick Mahomes at his average draft position right now from rounds two to four. So let me know your quarterbacks. And before we move on to the tight ends, I also want to know about the tight ends. Which tight ends are you staying away from outright? Which tight ends are you not drafting at their ADP? Which tight ends are you worried about? Any of that stuff, I love the engagement down below. So just drop a comment and I'll probably answer your comment. First one up on this list is Eric Ebron of the Colts. Right now he's tight end seven, 69th, nice overall. This is one I've battled myself with back and forth this off season. His ADP is going in the right direction. It's going down a little bit. He's getting a little bit cheaper to draft. He was originally this off season, like a tight end four or five right behind the big three, right? Kittle, Ertz, and Kelsey. But now he's back to tight end seven. The easy argument for people, and I think the lazy argument to make here is that, oh, he's just going to regress, right? He scored 13 touchdowns last year. He led all tight ends in this category. In a normal year, he would probably lead the NFL in receiving touchdowns with 13. I will preface by saying this though. I think people are going to start fading Ebron too much because they just hear the word regression. And this was something that hurt a lot of people when they just said that about Terry Kill last year and Brandon Cooks and all of these players, they just say regression. Sometimes people are just hashtag good at football or hashtag in, this is not an actual hashtag, so scouts that last hashtag, but just in really good situations like Eric Ebron is, man. So sure, he might be touchdown dependent in 2019, but that's not necessarily the worst thing because he's on one of the best NFL offenses with an elite quarterback who throws to tight ends, especially in the red zone as much if not more than any quarterback in the entire NFL. Now, Ebron won't repeat his 14 touchdowns from last year. He had 13 receiving, one rushing. Don't ask me how he fucking ran the ball in, but he did. But would you really be surprised if 
he ended up with eight or nine touchdowns this year. Like Andrew Luck throws the ball to the tight end position in the red zone at a rate of like 30 to 35%. So Ebron catching eight touchdowns would not be a surprise. And if you catch eight touchdowns at the tight end position, you're almost guaranteed to finish as the top five or seven fantasy tight end, depending on how strong the position is that year. But I will say there are a lot of things working against Ebron, right? This is a do not draft list. So why am I hyping up Ebron right now? We just heard about some random groin injury that he had. He had surgery on the groin. That uh, that could be a cleanup. We don't know, but that's absolutely a red flag. I hate anything involved with the groin, the middle of the body, where it's like your core and everything else is attached to that. A lot of times those end up being things that cause other injuries. And I got a lot of comments about bringing Dr. Jesse Morse back onto the channel to talk about more injuries because we didn't do quarterbacks or tight ends. So that would be good. Maybe I'll get him back on the channel for some time later this month to talk about quarterbacks and tight ends. What I'm going to do, I'll have him back on later in the summer too, once training camp kicks off and there's more injuries. I'm going to have him on throughout the season. I think I'm probably going to partner up with him and the fantasy doctors and once a week because I want to do five videos a week throughout the actual regular season too. I'm going to have him on once a week. And we'll talk about all of the ongoing injuries in the regular season. So I think you guys will enjoy that. I'll enjoy that because obviously I'll, I'll learn a lot from him. So stay tuned for that. That'll be a good addition to the channel. They had Devin Funches. They had Paris Campbell. Both guys expect to come in and make an immediate impact on the offense. Not massive impact, but you look at Paris Campbell probably getting a lot of short intermediate routes right over the middle where Eric Ebron runs a lot of his routes, but more so Devin Funches in the red zone, right? That's where Eric Ebron eats in the red zone. Devin Funches is big 6'4", 6'5". He's going to get some of those targets down there. And we're assuming Jack Doyle will be back. I really hate the narrative that, oh my God, like, look, just looking at the snap numbers right now. And this was something I looked at in the beginning of the year. But eventually, if Jack Doyle can't stay on the field, then then the Colts are going to stop making Jack Doyle having 80% of the snaps, you know, a priority or, or part of their game plan. So after having Eric Ebron be so successful last year, I don't think they're going to go back to like an 80 to 20% snap split, right? So we even saw down the stretch, when Doyle finally returned for that last little stint he had, I think from like weeks 9 to 12, Eron was playing at like a 50% snap rate. When in the beginning of the year, he was playing at like 20% of the snaps when Doyle was on the field. So by the end of the year, they were like, okay, Ebron's good for this offense. We're going to keep him on the field even when Jack Doyle is gone or back. But overall, that does hurt his ceiling and his floor a little bit, having him back on the field. Anyways, there's a lot of moving parts here with Ebron. We saw his upside last year, which is phenomenal, but he's not going to repeat that. He's not going to catch 13 touchdowns again. But he could still absolutely be a top five to seven tight end um, if he scores those touchdowns, which is not out of his range of outcomes with Andrew Luck at quarterback. He'll probably end up being a mid to upper tight end one this year, uh, mid to lower tight end one, I should say. But he is touchdown dependent. And that's the, that's the only thing, which means he'll probably have as many bad games as he does good games, which is not something that I exactly want in my lineup, right? I, I try to stay away from guys who can't put up points on a consistent basis, like right? the Kenyon Drakes, Eric Ebrons, and the guys who just score a lot of touchdowns but don't rack up yards and receptions. I think we're going to look back on the numbers and we will see him finish top 10, probably top eight. And people will be like, wow, I hated Ebron too much. And I just think it's like, just sometimes just stop thinking about things too hard, right? I like to jump into the numbers as much as anybody else, but elite offense, elite offensive line, they're not going to ask him to block that much. Elite quarterback who throws to tight ends at a ridiculous rate. So that being said, like you look at pick 69, the reason he's on this list is I would rather take Hunter Henry, who's going at like 66. Tyler Boyd, Rashad Penny, even Latavius Murray probably are all guys going around that pick that I would probably take over Eric Ebron. Austin Hooper, my next tight end. Tight end 11, 100th overall. I think I'll get a lot of disagreement with this one as well. He had a semi-big year, but this guy, this guy freaking stinks. This guy, this guy fucking stinks. Austin Hooper, get him out of my face. He had as many zero yard games last year as he did 80 yard games. No, he had more zero yard games last year than he did 80 yard games. That's because he had zero 80 plus yard receiving games last year, my friends. And he had a zero receiving yard game against Arizona in week 15. More games of zero yards than 80 yards. It has been 33 games since Austin Hooper has surpassed 80 receiving yards in a game. You have to go all the way back to week one of 2017 to find a game he went over 80 receiving yards. It was only because some shitty safety on the Bears blew the coverage and Austin Hooper was literally wide open. There was no guy within 40 yards of him. Matt Ryan placed a beautiful deep ball, a beautiful spiral in Hooper's pocket. And he went, he went yard. He went deep. Other than that, the guy ain't giving you any sort of upside. He had three decent games last year in which he scored his touchdowns in. And that was the only reason why his fantasy finish was anywhere near the top guys. Otherwise, the guy scored fewer than seven fantasy points in 10 of 16 games. I'm good. I'm a Falcons fan. I know what Hooper is. There's no upside there. There's no breakout coming. I'm sorry, guys. I know he's young. People like to get excited about nothing, but it's not Austin Hooper season. Last guy up on this list. I'm probably going to, and then we'll go into some honorable mentions for tight ends. 
Trey Burton of the Chicago Bears. Tight end 14, 121 overall. I wrote this prior to the news coming out about his like hernery, hernery, hernery surgery, hernia surgery. So that's another thing to factor into this mix. Supposedly he's going to be ready for camp and he's ready for the season, whatever. We heard that before with every other player that's ever had an injury in the history of the earth. Chicago has a lot of mouths to feed and you're getting fed by a quarterback that's not exactly the most accurate when it comes to passing, especially not down the field. He's also a quarterback that takes a decently high percentage of his pass attempts and ends up running with them, which obviously hurts the other weapons in this offense. You also have to remember that Adam Shaheen, a guy that the Bears were very high on, missed almost the entire season last year, right? He had this foot ankle injury in the summer that put him on the IR. He returned in week 11. By that point in the season, nine games in, Trey Burton had one big game. Went 9 for 126 and 1 against New England. But through those 9 games, even with that included, that big game, Burton was giving you 3.5 receptions and 45 receiving yards per game. Which is not exactly amazing numbers because when you have a tight end that's like Trey Burton's size, right? 6'3", 235, he's got to be someone that moves around better. He's got to be someone that makes plays after the catch, is explosive, can make guys miss, right? You can't be giving me the 3 for 45. I need 3 for 60, 3 for 70. I need more explosive plays if you're small and you're not going to be involved in the red zone and you're not going to be scoring those easy touchdowns that make the legit elite fantasy tight end ones just that, tight end ones. Trey Burton is not that. He doesn't have the size to be on the field for all three downs. He's the move tight end but he doesn't move that well. He needs to be quicker, he needs to be shiftier, and he doesn't have that. But once Shaheen returned in week 11, Burton's numbers somehow dipped even further. You look at these splits, man, he goes down to three receptions a game, 22 receiving yards a game. Burton did not go over 36 receiving yards in any of their final seven games to close out the year. And he had the same amount of targets as Shaheen did inside the 10 yard line over that span, over the remainder of the season. You also look at the snap share here, right? Things started going a little bit more towards Shaheen and a little bit less towards Burton. It was higher, right? Burton was getting 80, 80, started going into the 70s. And then the final couple weeks of the season, like you see Shaheen getting 31, 45, 45, 57% of the snaps as the season's going on. There's a reason that he was targeted as much as Trey Burton was inside the 10 yard line while playing, you know, 50% of the snaps. For as cliche as it is, right, people always make fun of it, like, oh, this tight end was a basketball player. Gene was a basketball player. He was a stud in college. And that usually translates into, it doesn't always translate into being a a great tight end in the NFL, but it usually means that you're a very good red red zone target. And that's what Shaheen is, man. He's an absolute beast. Look at his size, 6'6", 278 pounds, 83rd percentile weight adjusted athlete. He was a second round pick, so he has the high draft capital. The injury really derailed him, and I think he would have been way more involved in this offense had he not been hurt. He's going to absolutely kill Trey Burton in the red zone, and we just saw, like, Trey Burton was giving you 23 yards per game when Adam Shaheen was on the field, guys. I wouldn't be shocked if Burton finished around the same numbers last year, give or take 50 receptions, 500 to 600 receiving yards, but I would set that over-under for his touchdown total probably at four, maybe three and a half, not the six he scored, which is going to move him down tight end rankings very quickly if he's not scoring touchdowns. So some honorable mentions, like please do yourselves a favor and stop drafting these 41-year-old tight ends coming off extremely serious lower body injuries. Fellaini Walker, Greg Olson. Walker is far from 100% right now. I see a lot of people in the comments always like, and Delaney Walker is going to be involved in that offense. I mean, I, I don't, I like, you, you have to hate the Titans passing offense in terms of like drafting their weapons for fantasy, but Delaney Walker is not the reason why you fade Corey Davis. Delaney Walker, I would be shocked if he actually made a real impact this year. Same thing with Greg Olson. Delaney Walker is going to be 35 years old. He is coming off of a broken ankle. That's a pretty damn serious injury. You don't heal quickly or get your explosion back when you're 35 years old coming off an injury like that. I don't even think he started jogging yet. I don't even think he started running yet. They keep saying there's no timetable, which is AKA like he's very far off from returning. And you have to go through the the jogging, the sprinting, the planting, the working out and getting the muscles stronger back around that ankle and sprinting and cutting and planting. There's a huge process for this. I wouldn't be surprised if Delaney Walker ended up on the pup list, to be honest with you. And when he does come back, ends up being a 40 to 50% snap guy this year. They had AJ Brown, they had Adam Humphreys. This is going to be run heavy. Don't waste your time with Delaney Walker. Don't waste your time with Greg Olson. His foot injury was a monster concern coming into last year. Then he re-injured it, came back, re-injured it again. Like what makes you think he's not going to re-injure it again this upcoming season? I'd be shocked if it upheld the entire 2019 season. Ian Thomas is the tight end to target in this Carolina passing offense if you are going to take one of them. He is a 70th percentile weight adjusted speed score athlete. Over the last five games of the season when Olsen was gone and Ian Thomas really took over that role. Look at his numbers, man. Five receptions, almost 50 receiving yards, and he scored two touchdowns in those five games. That was almost 10 half PPR fantasy points per game. 
over 12 PPR fantasy points per game. That's like legitimate, really good numbers for a tight end that you could scoop off the waiver wire. Thomas is a very, very sharp buy low candidate in Dynasty League because I, I don't see Greg Olson holding up. And if he does, he's here for one more year, probably tops. And then Ian Thomas takes over as that guy. He's literally 22 years old right now. I think he does turn 23 tomorrow maybe depending on i forget when this video comes out shout out ian thomas super young happy birthday big man don't let the big dog nation down take ian thomas with one of your picks at the end of the best ball drafts and and in your season long league if you want to but that wraps up the list so i hope you guys enjoyed that video uh, as always i try to bring you as much value as possible and in return all i ask is for a thumbs up lets me know you appreciate the video subscribe to the channel if you're new as always we're gonna be breaking down everything 2019 fantasy football throughout the off season into the off season next year for dynasty everything go cop the big dogs draft guide bigdogsdraftguide.com it's got everything you need to prep for your fantasy football season if you don't have time to consume podcasts or any of my videos the best stuff will be included in there i promise you that so drops july 1st i'm working hard behind the scenes on that bad boy go check out the vlog i dropped yesterday as well i like i like to give you guys a look at what's going on behind the brand and stuff the blow up is here 2019 is big dogs here baby i'll see y'all on the next episode love you just stick around this one. Oh,